Over three years ago, just 27 British veterans of the great armies who fought in the First World War remained alive. They were aged from 102 to 107. Ninety years ago, they all shared the same nickname, Tommy Atkins. In 1916, the Tommies were about to endure their darkest hour in the Battle of the Somme. British losses would be catastrophic in the slaughter and sacrifice of the next two years. September the 22nd, half past ten at night. That's when I lost them. That's my Remembrance Day. But as the tide of war turned, some would be involved in the British Army's most successful campaign ever. I found the German machine gun. I put my hand on the grips, pressed the centre with me, me thumbs, and the belt was dancing like a snake until he finished. I don't have it. 87 years after the war, Harry Patch becomes the last Tommy ever to visit the Western Front. It would lead to a final reconciliation with a former enemy. Five and a half million British soldiers fought in the First World War. Soon, the last of the Tommies will be gone forever. Hello, lovey. How are you? In March 2004, in Perth, Western Australia, the youngest of the British veterans of World War I reached his 103rd birthday. You're Tom, aren't you? No, I'm McLean. McLean. McLean, oh, yes. Yes, yes. Robert. Robert oh, Baker's yes. boy. <laughs> I've got so many grandchildren, I forget half of them. <laughs> Claude Schulz was celebrating with his children, some of his 11 grandchildren, and 22 great grandchildren. Hello, my oh, it's lovely to see you. you. How are you? You're looking fantastic. Claude. Oh, 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 grandfather, our oh, oh, grandfather. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Mm, I'm getting spoiled. <laughs> so you should. At 103. Yeah. I never thought I'd have this sort of. Side from neighbour. One <laughs> time I great, thought I'd great, never great get married. Much yeah. never, oh, never find a, a wife anywhere. Now you're responsible <laughs> for all of this. <laughs> now you're looking for the next one for the next hundred years. Mm. <laughs> right. At the outbreak of the conflict, he tried to join the army, but was too young. He settled for the navy. Yet he was to witness the human cost of the greatest British disaster of the war the Battle of the Somme. We used to see hospital ships coming across the channel from France into England and the, the soldiers being wheeled off the, uh, off the ships into, uh, sometimes into trains to go to the nearest uh, main hospital for, for treatment. We would see that and we'd think, oh, poor, poor devils, you know, they, they must have been through hell before they got to this stage. So confident was some of victory on July the 1st, 1916, that one captain provided footballs to take over the top and dribble through no man's land. Battle of the Somme led to catastrophic losses. Little ground was gained from the Germans, and Britain's volunteer army was decimated. In the first few hours alone, 20,000 Tommies lost their lives. Despite official propaganda, news of the losses sent shockwaves through the ranks. 
the Somme was to become a byword for the horrors of modern war. Harry Patch was one of the two million Tommy conscripts who swelled the ranks of Britain's depleted volunteer army after the battle. He was soon acquainted with the trenches. If any man tells me he went into the front line and he wasn't scared, he's a liar. You were scared, Steph. In the trench, you were all right. If you kept down, sniper couldn't get you. But you never knew if the artillery had a shell that burst above you and you caught the shrapnel. In September 2004, aged 106, Harry was about to leave behind his 92-year-old girlfriend, Doris. I got no relatives of my own. She's my only companion. Shows her temper sometimes. God, let who know who's bothering you. <laughs> if you're ready. He was embarking on one final pilgrimage to the Western Front to lay the ghosts that had haunted him since the First World War. One. I got some bitter memories. That's the trouble. Now I can't forget it. Eighty-seven years. It's a long time. In 1917, Harry found himself in Belgium for the first time. He would soon take part in the next major summer offensive as a member of a machine gun team. Well, I made friends with the Lewis gun team. There were five of us. And um, we were just like that, comrades. The team consisted of the gunner, his assistant who changed the magazines, and three others who carried ammunition and provided cover. Number one, he was a lance corporal. He came from Enley on Thames. Now I was a plumber, he was an electrician. Number three, came from Truro. Number four and five came from Falmouth. One was a shoemaker, the other was a grocer. And that was it. That was our team. Whatever parcels we had, we always gave it number one, and he would divide it as much as he could. Now, I used to get a uh, parcel from home. My mother knew a grocer pretty well. And in that parcel would be an ounce of Royal Seal tobacco. Now, number three, was a pipe smoker, same as me. That ounce of tobacco was cut in half. He had half, I had half. <laughs> pair of socks, perhaps. You had a pair of socks, holes in it. All right, socks were yours. And that's how our comradeship we were just one. This close comradeship would change Harry's life forever. But war was ultimately to shatter their remarkable friendship. In 1917, life in the trenches grew harsher for the Tommies. There was a constant threat from shelling, snipers and disease made worse by fighting over the same piece of ground for two years. No man's land was full of dead bodies, and the smell in the summer, oh, stink, stink like the devil. From the time I went to France, the second week in June 1917, 
until I left. I never had a bath. I never had any clean clothes. You slept on the fire and step, if you could, shells bursting all around you. Jim Lovell broke army regulations to remove the lice from his clothes. Only his status as a corporal saved him from serious punishment. I suppose you have about two or three hundred to the inch in the summer. Yes, and uh, one day I got fed up one summer and I, I stripped off and left and it come down and caught me. Of course, you're supposed to have your all packed and everything ready for fire for action. <coughs> he waited till I dressed and he saw who I was and he let me off. He said, don't you do that again. That had been a private, he'd been, he'd been charity. Percy Wilson was a Lewis gunner. His corporal had his own method of getting rid of lice. He'd be smoking his cigarettes and he'd pull these lice from under his arms and put them on the end of his cigarettes. <laughs> That's another one we've got. <laughs> Arthur Halestrap, a wireless operator with the Royal Engineers, sought his mother's help to combat the parasites. I asked my corporal what, soon after I went up to the, the trenches, how do I get rid of these lice? Oh, he said, get a light a candle and run the candle up the seams. Well, of course, the seams came apart because the, the, the candle burned the stitches. So I wrote home to Mother. I said, I've, I've got these body lice. What can I do? And she wrote back and said, you silly boy. She said, you've got some light boy soap. Use that. For each lousy lice, he had his own particular bite and his own itch, and he'd drive you mad. Used to turn our vest inside out to get a little relief. And tomorrow, you'll be just as lousy as you were today. While the lice preyed on the living, other creatures fed on the dead. Rats thrived on the corpses that littered no man's land. And you could feel the rats running up and down you, you know. We were awful. But you got that used to it when if you were that tired, you didn't, you didn't know them. But next morning, they were running with rats when you were trying to have a nap. You could feel them running across you, you know. Men were separated from their wives and sweethearts for months on end. More Tommies suffered from venereal disease than trench foot, as soldiers found comfort behind the lines. For some, the long separation from home would lead to greater tragedy. Jonas Hart, a private in the Essex Regiment, was with a married comrade when he got a letter. Worst fellow outside of me, married man, uh, one for him. Oh, yeah. We read that later, are we? Put his rifle at the side of the trench, and before anybody could stop him. I was over the top and walked out in the new no man's land. He'd gone about 20 paces, he was dead. We all found out afterwards that was a dear John letter saying she was living with another man. When I come home, she wants to pass. He committed suicide. What a lovely day, Harry. Beautiful. Respite from the horror of trench life, 
came for many Tommies at Talbot House in the Belgian town of Poppering. Harry Patch first visited this oasis of relative peace in 1917. Oh. Good afternoon. Thank you. You could come in here, you could join in the activities, or you could get a book to read. If you got a book, the payment was your cap. And when you added a book in, you got your cap back. That was it. And no rank, no matter who you were, you were all equal here, officers and men, no difference. It was somewhere to come and try to forget it. You couldn't forget it. You were within the sound of the gun. Talbot House, or Toc H as it became known, was run by the Reverend Tubby Clayton. He had a deep voice. He could sing a good song, he could tell a good tale. He was the life and soul of the party here. Downstairs, soldiers could relax in the library and garden. On the fourth floor, they could worship together in Clayton's tiny chapel. May he keep you in peace and in health, now and always. Amen. Amen. Get upstairs, he's a different man. In 1917, Harry and his machine gun team received Holy Communion here, before going into battle. He knew, and we knew, there was someone in the congregation who wouldn't come back. And he knew it, and he tried to reassure us all that everything was all right. He knew damn well it wasn't, and so did we. Across the street from Toc H is a chocolate shop that existed during the war. Who, who did you want the chocolates for? Uh, Star. Yeah. And uh, Doris. Right. And do you think that'll be enough? I should think so. Good. If not, they'll have to come and get them. <laughs> has Doris got a sweet tooth? I don't know. <laughs> I bet she has. She may not have any. <laughs> There we are. Right, it's going In to the summer of 1917, Harry and his comrades didn't have much time for chocolate. Talk then was about where and when the next major offensive might be. And I think a nice cup of tea is waiting. Morecambe, Lancashire, 2004. Oh! Come on, Arthur Barraclough, aged 106, was still living at home with his wife, Mary. I can't see the door. Like Harry Patch, he was a member of a machine gun team. Right, turn left. Left. By the spring of 1917, he'd already gone over the top in an attempt to break through the German lines. Oh, right. Oh, take his stick. In April, he took part in an assault on enemy defences using the latest technology, tanks. We had four tanks on our front, and there was a platoon behind each tank. We were marching behind the tank, and when the tank come across the German line, these two lines, the platoons had to open out the, top of the German front line. It was quite a good idea. But the trouble was, there had been a lot of rain at this time. Tanks had first been used in 1916, but there were too few to have had an impact. As numbers increased and mechanical problems were ironed out, they became more effective. But they still struggled in the mud of the Western Front. 
without it got going behind the tanks before the tanks got stuck. But the tanks were that heavy, they just dug, up, dug them into the sludge and stuck there. They couldn't get rid of them. In 1917, the Allies needed something else to provide a quick, decisive breakthrough. Secret Royal Navy reports were predicting British shipping losses might mean a collapse in Britain's war effort within six months. The solution was another summer offensive. The Battle of Passchendaele was to be the final great battle of attrition of World War I. Waiting to go over the top were Harry and his mates, well aware of what the Germans would do to a captured member of a feared Lewis gun team. If we'd been taken prisoners, you'd have been lined up and shot with your own gun. They witnessed a 10-day bombardment of enemy trenches. 3,000 guns and four and a quarter million shells pulverized no man's land. On the 31st of July, the assault began. Then it began to rain the heaviest summer rains for 30 years. Harry and his comrades were thrown into this maelstrom when they stormed the feared enemy stronghold of Pilkham Ridge. Then the Germans counterattacked. But the Lewis machine gun jammed as a desperate German soldier broke through. He came towards us with a rifle and a fixed bayonet. He had no ammunition, otherwise he could have shot us. I had to bring him down. First of all, I shot him in the right shoulder. He dropped the rifle. He came on. His idea, I suppose, was to kick a gun if he could in the mud. And for our own safety, I had to bring him down. I couldn't kill him. He was a man I'd never knew. I didn't know his language. Couldn't talk to him. I shot him above the ankle, above the knee. He went down. Said something to me in German. God knows what it was. But for him, the war was over. Six weeks later, Harry was to feel very differently about shooting to wound a German. If I had met him after I'd have had no trouble at all in killing him. The event that led to this change of heart had a profound effect on Harry. 87 years on, he made it clear to travelling companion Nick Fear that he still wanted to avoid the place where it happened. Pilkham Ridge. No. I never want to see Pilkham again. We will be travelling across the old battlefields, but we will not be going anywhere near Pilkham Ridge because that was what Harry said. He, he literally doesn't want to go anywhere near it. For Harry, two opposing trenches separated by no man's land were the limits of his war. Going for a fly? Yes. Hey, All right, yes. good. When was the last time you Claude Schulz was part of the wider conflict on land, sea and air that stretched over four continents. In 2004, he was about to receive one of his 103rd birthday presents. Got there. And where do I go? Which... I've got hearing aids in both ears, so watch it a little bit. I'll oh, be ears. careful on those. Yeah. 
it's a long time since I was flying. Wonderful up there. Claude had worked with biplanes in the First World War. They had quickly become invaluable weapons for both sides. Flying on reconnaissance missions over the battlefields and dogfights raged over the trenches. The new threat had brought war to millions of civilians for the first time. German airships were now targeting Britain's cities. Innocent people died, never mind about the soldiers and sailors who died. Bloody German zeppelins coming over, dropping bombs over London and places like that. We hated the zeppelins. Claude's battleship was part of the response to this menace in the skies. Seaplane bombers were used to knock out the Zeppelin threat. His job was to winch them into the water. I was in the Revenge. We took a, a ship full of seaplanes into Germany in World War I, and they raided the Zeppelin sheds on the island of Borkum, I think it was, where these German Zeppelins had been built and they, they blew, blew the place up, these seaplanes, because we, sea, we didn't have any aircraft carriers where they could land on or fly off then. They had to be lowered into the sea and fly off the sea and come back alongside the ship if they were lucky and get picked up and, and hoisted inboard. The raids on the Zeppelin sheds were only partly successful. British cities were bombed until the last year of the war. Oh, lovely. Long way down. <laughs> OK. Well, I'm on terra firma. Almost. Once the more down. terror, the less bloody firma. <laughs> <laughs> or the, the more firma, the less terror, I should say. <laughs> lovely. On terra firma in 1917, Harry and his machine gun team were just five Tommies amongst the 700,000 locked in the killing fields of Passchendaele. By the middle of September, the British were making slow progress through the mud of Flanders. But Harry's ordeal was about to come to a terrible end. The night we caught it, we had taken the German front line, the German support line. We had to cross what was the old no man's land. And it was crossing there, a rocket burst amongst us. It killed my three mates. It wounded me. All I can remember was a flash. I went down, blew me down. September the 22nd, I passed ten at night. That's when I lost them. That's my remembrance day. Tyne Cot is the largest British war cemetery in the world. It contains nearly 12,000 graves, many of Tommies from the Battle of Passchendaele. 8,000 of them are unknown soldiers. On its walls are the names of 35,000 more Tommies whose bodies have never been recovered. And amongst them, Harry is convinced are his three lost comrades. 
It's painful. I got three mates buried somewhere. I don't know where. It's too many. When you look at it, why did they die? Look at it. Why? All of them dead? No. The Battle of Passchendaele ended without a breakthrough and with over 325,000 Tommy casualties. Yet, despite the trauma, the Tommies did not crack. But some did start to feel that they were just cannon fodder. Alfred Finnegan, in 2004, aged 108, remembered this disillusionment with the top brass in Seafrick Sassoon's poem, The General. It was written after another costly British offensive, the Battle of Arras. Good morning, good morning. The general said, as we passed him one day on our way to the line. Now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead and they're cursing his staff for incompetent swine. He's a cherry old card, grunted Harry to Jack, as they slogged up to Arras with rifle and pack but he did for them both with his pan of attack. In the trenches, a strong bond grew between officers and men. They suffered together. But a few soldiers dared question authority, and a handful may have gone further. 85 years after the war, Corporal Jim Lovell was still reluctant to reveal what happened to one lieutenant on patrol with some of Jim's platoon. The captain sent a patrol out on the night. They all come back by the lieutenant. Oh, that was a mystery, that was. They all come back. I know nobody didn't like it. What, what happened to the lieutenant? I don't know. Nobody don't know. <laughs> what do you <laughs> think happened to they the had, lieutenant? They had to keep quiet. <laughs> I didn't say nothing about that. <laughs> do you think they may have shot him? I don't know. I don't know what happened. No. <laughs> Most soldiers had little choice but to obey. Yet mutual respect thrived. The men knew their officers were more likely to be killed than they were. Only by holding together could they survive the appalling carnage. By the autumn, both sides were facing a fourth winter in the trenches, each desperately hoping that an assault or a wonder weapon would lead to a breakthrough. As early as 1915, both sides used poison gas. Yes, gas, gas! Arthur Barraclough found himself the victim of a gas attack with only a crude mask for protection. There were terrible things to wear. They smelled the disinfectant and it just went tight around your head and just one little tube to breathe. Out with, you couldn't breathe in it. You would be fighting for breath coming through your gas mask. And this went on uh, while the gas mask was, where the rays were on. Some of the lads, they just simply got fed up, they couldn't stand it no longer, and they just grabbed all of them and pulled them out and threw them away. They always said, well, sorry, I'd rather be gas than and try and breathe under these things. You can't breathe it off. Gas claimed over 90,000 lives. Many Tommies who inhaled it suffered hideous injuries. Jim Lovell was gassed in the spring of 1918 when Germany, almost starved into submission by naval blockade, launched a last desperate offensive. They sent over shells with gas in, and some of them exploded near us. And I had a mouthful. 
and they put me in ambulance and sent me to the hospital. In hospital, Jim was to encounter a Tommy secret weapon, black humour. They're joking all the time, everybody's joking all the time, see. Like a, like a clergyman come round to hospital once, he said to a man, he said, have you been wounded? No, he said, I've been hit with a blood orange. <laughs> Jim himself was to become the butt of a cruel joke. I was three days, and the bed was full of lice, and uh, the doctor came, he said, on his round, he said, Oh, you're feeling horrible? Well, I said, Not too bad, sir. He said, What division do you belong to? I said, The 18th. He said, Would you like to go to the seaside? Well, I said, Yes, sir. He said, uh, Get yourself ready. He said, the Ambulance will be going in, in about half an hour. Well, when he said the Ambulance, I thought it was genuine, see. Jim thought he was in for a treat, but quickly realised the terrible truth. So there was 12 of us. Six of us got each, in each little dentist. We was riding for about three quarters of an hour and it was getting bumpy. They stopped, they pulled the sheet up, we was up behind the line. This was no holiday. Jim had been tricked back to the front a measure born out of desperation. The Allies were launching their counter-offensive, the big push, and they needed all the available Tommies they could get. The day we, we had to go up the line to start the big push, uh, General Rawlison got on a platform and he said, we're gonna start the push, he said, to finish the war. On August the 8th, the big push began. Oh, that was a battle, that was. Early, early in the morning to late at night. And we was up again, the German guards. They were the best soldiers they had. Best soldiers. We couldn't, we couldn't go a couple of inches at a time or a couple of feet at a time. And uh, they was popping our chaps up. You couldn't, you couldn't show yourself. No. Oh. Jim put an abandoned German machine gun to good use. And I turned it round and kept my head down and I pressed the oh, that was a lovely sound that was. I, I I pressed the I put my hand on the grips, pressed the centre with me my thumbs, and the belt was dancing like a snake until he finished. I don't have it. Well he might have hit somebody, I don't know all, because I had my head down, see, like that. Oh, lovely thing. <laughs> Arthur Hailstrap was about to go over the top with his team of wireless operators, but one of them refused to budge. He had shell shock, and he was useless on the floor of the trench, and we had the order to go over the top. The corporal looked at me and said, well, he said, we can't do much about him, so we'd better get on with the job. More than 300 Tommies were executed during World War I for cowardice and desertion, even though many of them may have been suffering from shell shock. But this Tommy was lucky. He didn't remember a thing about it. And we never mentioned it to him, and the corporal didn't mention it to anyone and he didn't remember anything. So I had much admired that corporal because he could have reported him, and he didn't. Tommies, like Arthur and Jim Lovell, were taking part in perhaps the most successful campaign the British Army has ever undertaken. In a hundred days, this by now highly professional force swept the Germans before it. By October, the Hindenburg Line Germany's last fortified defence was breached. It looked like the war would soon be over. Harry Patch's pilgrimage to the Western Front was also drawing to a close, with one final astonishing act of reconciliation. After he lost his friends, Harry swore he never wanted to see another German again.
but in September 2004, he finally made up his mind to meet one of the last surviving German veterans of World War I. Charles Kearns comes from Alsace-Lorraine, on the border between France and Germany. Now he is a Frenchman, but in 1916, Alsace-Lorraine was part of Germany. I was conscripted into the Imperial Army of Kaiser Wilhelm II at the age of 19 in 1916. Like all people from Alsace, I didn't have a choice. Unfortunately, I fought against the English. The meeting was to be Harry's first close encounter with a German since 1917. The date had a special significance too. It was September the 22nd, 87 years to the day that his friends were killed by German artillery fire. It's the anniversary when I lost him. And this is the last time I shall ever come to Belgium. I mean, how my mind on that. Finally, on the morning of November the 11th, 1918, after four years of fighting and the loss of nearly nine million lives, the guns stopped firing. The silence was, I can only describe it as terrible. Everything dropped away from me. I thought, now, what do I do now? There's, there's no objective. There's nothing in front of us. I've just got to wait. And there was a s absolute silence. It's in, that was indescribable, really. When you have everything you'd been working for for years suddenly disappear. No future. What is my future? What am I going to do next? Fire! In a training camp on the Isle of Wight, Harry Patch, having recovered from his wounds, was preparing to return to the front with some target practice. There was some rumor that the armistice would be signed, and they said, if it is signed, We'll send a rocket up. Well, we watched. We saw the rocket go up. The sergeant said, no, we've got a lot of spare ammunition. It isn't worth taking it back. Fire it out to sea. So we began to fire it out to sea. One of Harry's comrades decided that the shed used by the markers who set up the firing range would be a better target. I said, you damn fool, the markers are in there, lying on the floor, and he was pumping live ammunition in. <laughs> the fun and games didn't end when they fired off all the ammunition. The sergeant was the next target in their sights. They didn't like him. Now they chased him along the pier at fresh water. Now that's a very long pier. And when he got to the end, they threw him in the sea. I didn't have to go back to those damn, lousy trenches. Percy Wilson was close to the German border on November the 11th. 
the officers called it to attention again and told us there was this armistice going to be signed. And there was some of them, the, <coughs> well, there was two or three round where I was. And, and one of them, uh, he, 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 he opened his mouth, he says, we don't want a bloody armistice. He says, we want to get over that border, he said, and we'll just show them what the war has been like. And in my opinion, if they'd got over that border, there'd never have been a Second World War. They wouldn't. They would absolutely have pounded Germany to bits. As the crowds at home celebrated, Claude Schulz was on the battleship Revenge. The captain ordered, splice the main brace, and that, that, that serve out an extra tot of rum all round for all hands. And that only happens on the very rarest of occasions. And uh, we spliced the main brace, and uh, the officers invited the ship's company, the sailors, to come on to the quarter deck and dance with them. The band was there and played up and we danced with our officers. Claude emigrated to Australia in 1926. That was me in 19, 1936. And my wife, the same, the same time, she's dead now, poor Ethel. She was a Scot, came from the north of Scotland, Lossiemouth. He settled in Perth and hasn't been back to Britain since. I'm lucky, aren't I? I reckon, to be surviving all that time. Blimey, yes. Yes, I've had a wonderful life, you know. If I had my time over again, I'd do exactly what I did. That's what I think about my life. Hmm. I've got no regrets about it, no. Five and a half million Tommies fought in the war. 750,000 of them lost their lives. The unimaginable suffering had transformed an entire generation. Some, like Harry Patch, found it hard to forgive. But on September the 22nd, 2004, Harry reached the end of a long journey that had started exactly 87 years ago to the day when he was wounded. Are you comfortable? Harry had been hit by a shell. He was about to meet Charles Kurnz, a German artilleryman, who'd fired onto Harry's sector close to where they were now meeting. Shoot to Mr. Kurnz, Monsieur, Monsieur Patch. It's lovely to meet him. He doesn't know it, but it's 87 years today that I was wounded at Pilkham. I, I hope you won't mind me asking this question, but if it was Mr. Kuntz who fired the shell, would you hold it against him today? No, not today, no. Oui, c'est moi qui l'a tiré les deux bus, hein. If he if, if, if fired, fired any shells, he never knew no. on whom. The most important thing is don't go to war. Settle it over the table. That's how the first two wars were settled, by negotiation over the table. And why should they do it after so many lives have been lost. Exactement, exactement. Tout à fait. C'est comme ça. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes tous des amis. Charles says that now that we're friends, we have to remain friends and we have to forget the past fightings and just concentrate on our friendship. Bravo, Harry, bravo. It's <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah. Very easy. Hello. Come on, take the photos. 
Back in 1919, as the civilian population began to adjust to peacetime, most of the Tommies were waiting to be demobbed, and some, like Harry, were becoming restless with army life. Now we had all listed for a duration of the war, which had been over for months. The sergeant major opened the door, and somebody threw a boot at him. He went back reported it. The officer came and they told him flat they weren't going out on parade. Well, he went back to the company office and about 30 of the men followed him and they asked for him. He came out he clicked the hammer back on his revolver. He said, the first man who says he's not going on parade, he said, I'll shoot him. And no sooner he said that, and back went 30 bolts. And somebody shouted, no shoot your bugger if you like. He disappeared. We were all run up. For a mutiny. The mutiny charges were eventually dropped, and Harry was demobbed in 1919. Many returning soldiers were to discover life had gone on without them. One Tommy, after four years in a German prisoner of war camp, came home to propose to Arthur Hale Strap's sister. He got a bitter shock. The um, young man who became fond of my sister met her at a dance, I think, and they became very great friends, and she became very attached to him. He was a well-educated young man. Well, when he went overseas, we searched the newspapers every morning when the casualties were published. They were published for the first few months, or perhaps a bit longer. And we never found his name. So, when the war finished, not having heard from him, we assumed that he was dead. I've uh, been in a prisoner of war camp for the last four years. It was the, the practice in those days for men to ask the, the, their sweethearts' fathers if they could marry. Well, I don't know how to tell you this. And, of course, my father told him that she was already married and it would be best not to contact her. It was decided not to tell her. I think he went to Australia. He didn't stay in the country. Most Tommies came home eager to forget, but some found those memories wouldn't go away. Harry Patch's journey of reconciliation was almost over. But on the way home from meeting Charles Kearns, Harry had one final change of heart. He decided to make a detour to the place he couldn't banish from his memory. Pilkham Ridge, where he lost his band of brothers. This monument to Harry's old division is close to the spot where they were killed. We've arrived at the memorial at Pilkham. Oh, yeah. It's a place that I never, ever thought that I'd be bringing Harry back to because he said he'd never, ever come back again. I think it's, um, it's the fact that it's this very special anniversary date for him, the date when he was actually hit, when he was wounded, and mainly because he's coming back to lay just a few ghosts which are still in his life from this terrible experience he had back in 1917 in the autumn. And he's come to remember his friends that he lost here.
Harry hadn't talked about his war experience until he was a hundred. He'd never wanted to meet a German again. But at last he could find peace with his old friends. platoon of 27 left in 2003, the survivors of five and a half million Tommies, has been further depleted. Jim Lovell was awarded the military medal for his exploits in World War I. He became the last surviving decorated veteran. In civilian life, he returned to blacksmithing, then became a welder. He lived until the age of 105 in the same house from which he'd volunteered as a 16-year-old in 1915. Arthur Barraclough, whose little prayer had protected him every time he went over the top, died in August 2004. He was still living with his wife, Mary. Arthur Halestrap went on to serve his country in World War II, where he was part of Churchill's secret army sending agents behind enemy lines. But he never forgot his experiences of World War I. He returned to the Western Front over 30 times. Still fiercely independent, Arthur died in April 2004. And today, four remain only two of them well enough to appear in our films. Alfred Anderson, oldest of the Tommies, is also Scotland's oldest man, aged 109. Remarkably, his war ended when he was wounded in 1916. He's the last of Britain's tiny pre-war army. And then there's Harry Patch, survivor of Passchendaele and the last Tommy ever to go back to the battlefields of perhaps the most devastating war Britain has ever experienced. He and his three comrades are the last Tommies. <laughs> <laughs> 